national and international agencies and has held research and teaching positions in the US, in Latin America, Switzerland, Spain, and France. Please join me in welcoming Mario Pelez. Professor Pelez, over to you. Okay. It says I cannot start. Okay, there I can. Okay. There we are. Okay. Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> can everybody hear me well? Everything is fine here? Everything is good. Okay, good. Okay. <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I know I'm getting to be old when you're called, you know, Professor Emeritus. Anyway, the subject uh, I will deal with is affordable housing, which is by any uh, measure a very complex issue. And I only have 25 minutes uh, to speak. So I will necessarily uh, gloss over many elements. In a nutshell, there are three dimensions, okay? Okay, why doesn't it go down? Okay, there it is. Okay, sorry. In a nutshell, okay, there are three dimensions to the issue of affordable housing. On the affordable side, first and most foremost, households need to have sufficient income to afford houses. On the supply side, you need responsive, efficient housing markets, which hopefully will produce housing at the lowest possible cost. And third, if the, fir if the first two aren't sufficient, if households, for example, don't have sufficient <clears throat> income, well, you'll need publicly financed public housing or which is also called social housing. For many developing nations, for the poor nations, we know that A is, is often the root problem. In this presentation, I'm in Montreal, I shall concentrate basically on, if you look at the screen, on B and C, okay, mainly on B, okay, which is the functioning of housing markets. And I will look at a at a rich world city, Montreal, which has been uh, reasonably successful in keeping housing uh, prices below. Okay, I realize that this presentation, this presentation will stay within, let's call it a liberal, uh, within the framework of liberal uh, market economies which is the dominant mode of housing in North America and Western Europe. Okay, next. Okay, here, just to show you the pricing range, here we have the typical, this is pre-COVID, okay, the, pre, uh, the typical price for a similar sized apartment in a similar downtown location in a number of <clears throat> Western cities. And as you can see, Montreal, and this has been true now over many of several decades, Montreal has systematically much <clears throat> lower costs. On average, prices, housing prices, whether owned or rented, are about half, close to half the price in the other two metropolitan areas of Canada, which are Toronto and Vancouver. So the question, of course, is when people see the lower housing prices in Montreal, the question is, well, what, what is Montreal's secret? Mm -hmm. How did we get there? Okay, a, a caveat is important here. This, in quote, success story I'm explaining to you is a story which hit, which is, was true until the COVID crisis, which in Montreal, like in almost the rest of the developing world and even in the developed world and even the developing world, 
everywhere housing prices exploded. But in relative terms, Montreal is still much more affordable than Toronto or Vancouver. Okay, so what was historically Montreal's secret, if I can express it that way? Okay. First, Montreal has traditionally had a fairly liberal, light regulatory framework in terms of building codes, uh, bylaws, etc. Second, which is in many ways a corollary of the first, is the absence of development charges, except for very proximate services like parks. But what are development charges? Development charges is when a developer or a builder comes in, <clears throat> he is asked to contribute to the financing of a whole set of infrastructures, which can vary according to the cities. In Toronto, the list is very long, <clears throat> water, sewage, schooling, policing, et cetera. Okay. Now, these development charges can be quite important. Montre in Montreal, that's number three, in Montreal, as in much of Quebec, the provision of urban services, the financing of urban services has, so to speak, been socialized, whether it be schools, policing, fire departments. These are financed through general revenue. By general revenue, I mean either through general real estate taxes, if we're talking about cities, or in the case of Quebec, provincial taxes, income taxes, et cetera, at the provincial level. So the, the, these services, the, the price is not passed on to the homeowner or the renter, except for uh, income uh, except for real estate taxes. Okay. Fourth, and which very much follows from, from those above, is a tradition in Montreal of mixed density housing, what people sometimes call the missing middle. And with corresponding zoning laws, which favor mixed densities. The fifth, which is a dramatic difference with the United States, for example, in Montreal, for all practical purposes, we have very few NIMBYs, you know, not in my backyard, very few NIMBYs opposition to densification or building, almost no housing related NIMBYs. Okay. So this has created a fairly unique market in which smaller builders okay, can move in and make building essentially much more competitive. Let me just look at it. Comparatively. Okay. okay, here we look at three indicators where we compare Montreal to its two competitors, Toronto and Vancouver. Montreal is brown, Toronto blue, Vancouver green. And the important thing is here Toronto is 100. Okay, so Toronto is always the highest. You can see no matter which indicator here we, we look at. Okay, whether it be the approval time to get a, a building permit, whether it be community opposition, opposition the, poss the probability of community opposition, which um, I call NIMBYs, or development charges, you can see that in, in all three cases, it's much easier to build than in the two competing cities. You can see the very big difference for development charges, where development charges in Montreal are about a seventh, those in Toronto. Okay. Let me repeat what this creates. I said this <clears throat> general framework where building is much less onerous, especially in terms of regulation and charges, makes it possible <clears throat> for smaller and intermediate builders to go into the market in which also by the same token facilitates this sort of middle range housing, which is typical of Montreal. Here we have a nice picture of uh, the emblematic house with their emblematic staircases of typical row houses 
in <coughs> Montreal. Okay. In such in these house, houses, often the owner and renters will live uh, next to each other, which also makes for a generally better social relationships. Okay. If you, anybody who knows Montreal, the center is very much dominated by this <coughs> sort of missing, uh, this missing middle. I, I say missing middle because in more oligopolistic markets, Toronto again is a good example, but also many US cities, most much housing is, is, um, is at the two, okay, <coughs> Uh, so the two extremes, either single family detached housing okay, or you know, high, um, high rise buildings. Okay, now let's go to the other foundation of Montreal's in general success, okay, which is public housing. Okay. Here I talk of a partial success. Okay. First, let me say, uh, uh, just let me uh, note that public housing is is a fairly small element of the total housing stock, less than 10%. And part of, part of the reason for this is in fact, that the market historically has generally done a fairly good job. I say uh, it's a partial success because in the last 10, 15 years, public housing has really been underfinanced in reason, reasons for, because of political squabbles and I won't go into the details of why, why it's not happening. But on the plus side, and that's what I want to insist on, on the plus side, public housing, which is often built by cooperatives then financed by the province or the, or the federal government, or generally by both, okay? Public housing has generally been of good quality, generally built in such a way that it fits into the neighborhood. I live in a fairly, upscale neighborhood, and there are quite a number of public housing projects in my neighborhood, but you couldn't tell them from the rest of the other houses here. Okay. Well, <clears throat> so you have many small and mid-scale units. And the other important point is this, these, this public housing has been dispersed consciously. This is a conscious city policy across the city, across the island, in neighborhoods of different, <clears throat> okay, of different social classes. And it's, I would say it's this, both the quality of, of and the small scale, the middle small scale of social housing and its general dispersion, okay, which largely explains the absence of NIMBYs to social housing. Okay. Here's a typical social housing. So you see fairly small scale project. This one is three, I think three stories. That's fairly typical. That's very, that's very different okay, from these huge housing estates you will find, for example, outside of Paris, the HLM, which have become unfortunately very concentrations of poverty and, <clears throat> and violence. Okay. So, so I see that I have exactly seven minutes left. So let us slowly conclude. Okay. 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 So I, I've I've divided my conclusion into two parts. One is the market. Okay. And the second is social housing. So conclusion one is the, the challenge here is keeping housing prices low, which means keeping the market responsive, efficient, and flexible. Okay. So I've, I've basically put out five rules here. Make, make it easy and profitable, because you want the builders to make profits, otherwise they're not gonna come in. I know that sounds like a dirty word, but it's, that's, that's what it's all about. So make it easy and profitable to build. Okay. Facilitate market entry, by developers of all sizes, not just the rich big developers. Keep the bylaws and building codes simple, simple and predictable and easy to get to understand. Unfortunately, in recent times, Montreal has now put in some bylaws which are fairly complicated. We'll see what happens. But in many cities, I don't wanna blame anybody, if you look at the building codes, and especially, 
the, the bylaws regulations needed to get a permit. <clears throat> what you need, you need an expensive lawyer, you need architects, engineers, and the small firms simply can't afford that. So keep it, make it possible for smaller builders to come in and build while still respecting you know, the rules in place. The third one, which is really a social choice, and here <clears throat> Quebec is, is an outlier in North America, typical of many other Quebec policies. Quebec has chosen, I don't know if we did it consciously or unconsciously, has chosen to finance urban infrastructures, schools, uh, roads, electricity, water, schooling is very, I put in schools because it's very important, out of general revenues, either local or provincial. The cost is not passed out on, passed on to homeowners, and which <clears throat> makes it, which is a very important factor keeping housing prices, not only low through competition, but just low in terms of costs. Fourth, and this has become increasingly a policy now in the Montreal urban region, because we now also have an urban community, an urban community okay, uh, is zoning that encourages mixed and mixed and mid and high residential densities of core along residential <clears throat> along transit corridors. I haven't talked about transit, but keeping <clears throat> Encouraging housing along transit route clearly is also a factor in affordability because the poor can't afford cars. On the NIMBYs, the fifth rule is that sure, local population should be consulted, we're in democracies, on new projects, but this is a personal opinion, they should not necessarily be given, local should necess necessarily be given absolute veto power that should stay with elected officials. Okay, now the second part of the conclusion concerns public housing. Even in the richest nations, some public housing will be necessary. There will always be households who will need income transfers or ought to be, have access. Income transfers aside, okay, well, that's a whole other policy issue which I will not deal, which I have not deal, dealt with. If we put income transfers aside, here again, there are th <clears throat> three basic rules. The first one is stable, predictable funding for public housing, avoiding politicization so we play as much as possible. And same thing holds for the funding rules, which means for um, access by cooperatives and other building associations access to public funds. Keep that simple and predictable. Second, which is essential, very different from said, the big, some of the big French projects, uh, small <clears throat> and mid-sized projects dispersed across the city and, and to avoid at all costs self-perpetuating <clears throat> concentrations of poverty. And, and for social housing, this is also a very <clears throat> sticky issue. Okay, make sure that the <clears throat> that the access criteria by poor people to social housing there again. <clears throat> the, the different criteria for resale and occupancy. That these rules are clear <clears throat> and limpid and clear and easy to understand. And again, as far as possible, to avoid politicization. Final rule is that one should not confuse the two. By the two, I mean one should not confuse what, what the state, what is the state's responsibility, and what markets can do. Markets are there to keep housing, <clears throat> housing prices as low as possible. What the state has to do is that there is always be some people, even with the most efficient markets, which will be left behind. We should not confuse the two and not ask the market to do what the public sector should do. Thank you very much. Merci.
Thank you very much, Professor Pelez. Um, yeah, I just, uh, before we move on into the other, I just wanted to clarify something or uh, observe something that we talked a lot about yesterday, which is that uh, the, the themes of the conference today are um, density, uh, diversity, and mobility. And we talk about the city in the era of cascading crises. Um, the housing affordability is kind of the elephant in the room uh, in, in as much as all these other crises have a major impact on housing affordability. And so when you look at what are the key effects of, of the various challenges facing cities, they all translate to really strong challenges in relation to housing affordability. So this is really great um, and relevant uh, to the larger theme of the conference. So thank you very, very much. And uh, now I'm going to turn it over to uh, my uh, co-moderator, Olivier, to introduce uh, Mimi Scheller. Olivier? Yes, thank you, uh, Ben. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you, Mimi Scheller. Um, she was recently named inaugural dean at the Global School of Worcester Polytechnic Institute, YEP, in USA. Before joining um, uh, the YEP, she was professor of sociology head of the sociology department and founding director of the Center for Mobility Research and Policy at Drexel University of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, she's founding co-editor of the journal Mobility and uh, past president of the International Association for the History of Transport, Traffic and Mobility. She helped to establish a new mobility paradigm, and she's considered to be a key terrorist in critical mobility research and in Caribbean studies. And it's a great pleasure to, to receive and listen her here today. She served on many international advisor boarding, including the Society for Caribbean Research, the Center, for advancing research in the global communication at the University of Pennsylvania, the Bowman Institute at the University of Leeds, the ASEAN Mobility Research Network at Kong University in South Korea, and the Global Partnership for Informal Transportation. Mimi Scheller has published more than 125 articles and books chapters she is uh, the author or co-editor of 15 books, including for, for the last one, Advancing Introduction to Mobility 2021, uh, Edgar Award Edgar Publisher, um, Island Future, Caribbean Survival in the Anthropocene 2020, Duke University Press, and Mob Mobility Justice, the Policy of Movement in the Age of Extreme, 2018, Verso Editor. Now, now let's um, talk to Mimi Scheller. She will address uh, the challenge of facing to the great, greater Caribbean and the role of its international partner may play in supporting and advancing more sustainable future for this area. Then Mimi Seller, we listen to you. Thank you, Olivier. And let me share my screen. It's great to be with you. Thank you for the invitation to be here. And I was uh, initially planning to speak specifically on mobilities, of course, for the topic of this conference, but because of um, developments that are happening uh, at this very moment in, in this current month, really, in the Caribbean, I, I sort of have focused my talk really on resetting policy with international partners and how can we together build a thriving Caribbean future. And of course, Canada and China and many African countries have been very involved in the Caribbean, right, and are important partners in the Caribbean and populations in the Caribbean. So I'm going to be drawing on my book, um, Island Futures, uh, which Olivier mentioned, which came out last year. And the Caribbean region is at a crucial crossroads right now of really challenging environmental conditions, political conditions, and social transformations that have been brought about partly by climate change and 
climate displacement, but also economic pressures, um, most recently caused by the, the huge travel disruption of the pandemic, which you know shut down tourism, of course, and much cross-border travel. But the Caribbean has also been buffeted by changing political alignments of both the traditional kind of what I call the great powers, um, the, you know, the US and, and EU in particular, and, and also the newer power of China in the region. As we all come out of the pandemic crisis and face the ongoing climate crisis, we have an opportunity to try to reset foreign policy with our neighbors in the Caribbean. So in this talk, I wanna argue that this is a really important time to build smarter, sustainable, equitable, and more cooperative international relationships that will help support better policies for the people and ecologies of the Caribbean region, which both of which are in very fragile condition at the moment. So I wanna focus on our collective international obligations to the region at this crucial moment in its history. Many things are up in the air right now. As you know, the president of Haiti, Jovenel Moise, was assassinated uh, just this last month under very murky circumstances that are still under investigation. And the country had already been rocked by protests and um, violence for uh, two years. And of course, before that, the ongoing recovery from the 2010 earthquake, which was still not complete. In Cuba, meanwhile, Protest demonstrations by everyday people have occurred for the first time in decades, just uh, again in July. At, at this moment, while the US embargo and thawing of relations with Cuba still remain unresolved. Added to these political conditions, of course, there is the looming climate emergency and ongoing efforts to recover from numerous recent hurricanes. The Caribbean, as you know, has been identified as one of the global climate change hotspots. That is, it's particularly sensitive to effects of climate change. And um, I, I won't belabor this point, but um, the climate scientist Michael Taylor has you know, pointed out that we're under a new climate regime. It's an extremely um, unusual conditions that are occurring with the, the number of category five hurricanes, the intensification of them and so on, the slow movement of them um, and the, the number of devastating impacts that they're having. Uh, so if the current climate situation can be described by scientists um, as unfamiliar and unprecedented, this does not imply that it does not have historical roots in terms of the vulnerabilities to this climate. How we conceptualize climate vulnerability has important implications for how we think about the recovery and the future of the region. It's crucial to recognize the complex historical factors that contribute to current vulnerabilities uh, across the Caribbean. And many um, analysts now refer to <clears throat> seemingly natural hazards such as hurricanes as unnatural disasters because of the ways in which risk and vulnerability are structured by all two human structures of inequality. April Baptiste and Kevon Riney have argued that marginalized groups experience climate change effects differently from the wealthy and privileged. And here in this example, we see when Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas, it was Haitian migrants and Haitian Bahamians who were the most vulnerable uh, to, to the effects because of the marginalized communities in which they lived and because of the immediate um, resurgence of um, things like this uh, Operation Sovereign Bahamas, which uh, sought to, as they put it, eradicate illegal immigrants in the Bahamas, shanty towns down. So as people were reeling from this devastating impact, there were calls for further you know, evictions, deportations, and um, removing these communities. So, these not so natural disasters um, are exacerbated by socioeconomic conditions, which um, play a role in explaining the intensity and the consequences of phenomena like hurricanes. No event is strictly or exclusively natural. And even the, um, you know, the United Nations Development Program, uh, which is quoted at the bottom here, um, makes that argument. Meanwhile, at the same time, there's other changes afoot in the Caribbean region. 
and the you know the U.S. Um, uh, foreign Affairs Committees and so on are very concerned about these things. As you know, they're concerned about China's Belt and Road Initiative. But China has invested over $8 billion um, just between 2005 and 2020, um, particularly in six Caribbean countries, but it, elsewhere as well. Investments focus on tourism, transportation, extractive metals, agriculture, and energy sectors. So there's a huge uh, set of infrastructural developments and extractive industries that are moving into the region through Chinese investment. Likewise, US corporations like Exxon are also developing massive deep sea oil fields off of Guyana and Suriname, opening a new fossil fuel frontier at the very moment when the world is pressing to reduce carbon emissions. While there is much emphasis on the sort of need for the US administration to rebuild key US alliances with the EU and Canada and other nations that were severely frayed under the Trump administration, we have kind of been ignoring our role in the Caribbean region. And there are other crucial alliances in this hemisphere that also need to be repaired. The countries of the greater Caribbean are our closest neighbors, uh, yet often forgotten, or worse yet, often harmed by US policies. And I speak as a US citizen here, so I'm speaking for my country, um, but I speak to Canadians as well and to Chinese um, citizens to think about shifting our Caribbean policies. What future, I'll shift here, part two of my talk, what future is there in a world without rainfall, a world without or with uneven rainfall and flooding, a world without coral reefs, an ocean without fish, not to mention an economy which we now see without tourists? In the aftermath of these hurricanes like Dorian, Irma, Maria, Michael, Matthew, that have devastated the Caribbean, and now the current situation of pandemic disruption, some people call for the tourism economy and cruise ship market to be restored, right? They want to see it bounce back. But others see this as a chance to rethink the forms of over tourism and unsustainable development that have severely impacted the ecology of the region. And I want to argue that we cannot afford to miss this moment. We must get it right before the Caribbean future slips away further. In the face of the climate emergency, as I've said, um, Anthropologists uh, like Puerto Rican um, Yarimar Bonilla wrote of the 2017 hurricanes, vulnerability is not simply a product of natural conditions, it's a political state and a colonial condition. So what responsibility do we bear as major emitters of greenhouse gases, as major developers of fossil fuel you know, in Canada and the US, as well as our roles in colonialism, slavery and resource extraction? The question is not just one of climate adaptation, but I would suggest also climate justice and climate debt. Should major contributors to global warming pay for rebuilding reparations and restitution? And how can we do that through better policies? In particular, how could, for example, sustainable tourism be part of a regional solution rather than part of the problem? Tourism in particular continues to benefit from uneven geographies of risk and vulnerability. And rather than looking at recent natural disasters as posing a threat to the tourist econ economy in the Caribbean, we could instead think about how to reposition tourism so it's not as extractive, it's not as predatory, it's not benefiting from the weaknesses of a region and instead is contributing to it. So I wanna take the current interruption of global travel as an opportunity to rethink forms of reconstruction and post-tourism sustainable development. And crucial to this is the idea of regenerative tourism and also how that might link with food justice and food sovereignty in the region. So in post-Hurricane Maria and Irma, Puerto Rico, for example, people formed um, what they called people's assemblies and they combined strategies around climate justice, food justice, and energy justice through organizations such as Resilient Power Puerto Rico. They sought to dis distribute solar power generators to create small scale community run microgrids. And organizations like Boricua Organization for Ecological Agriculture sent out 
agroecology brigades to deliver traditional seeds and soil and train people in their cultivation. And they called for a complete reconstruction of economies, labor relations, relations to the natural world and to each other. These kinds of critical alternative development strategies occur throughout the Caribbean region. You'll find them in Haiti and Jamaica, people calling for this kind of work. And this could really help, um, especially the small island developing states become less reliant on extractive industries and to create more sustainable, more equitable and less vulnerable um, communities in the face of climate change. So rather than rebuild uh, you know, under the policies of build back better, which have often brought in large scale uh, developments and, and, and there's been an ex a sort of explosion of extractive industries such as mining and oil drilled, drilling and building very large scale tourist hotels and developments. I hope that we can learn from these agroecological projects how to expand Caribbean food sovereignty and practices such as regener regenerative um, agriculture, silvo um, agroforestry, silvopasture, tree intercropping, use of tropical staple trees, et cetera, various kinds of gardening that draw on indigenous knowledge and horticultural practices. And at the same time, to combine that with more resilience through integrating it with regenerative tourism economies, but also things like digital innovation, right? And the call for new kinds of knowledge economies within the Caribbean. And I think there's a case to be made that these can be combined together. So I'm going quickly through this because I know we, we don't have um, a whole lot of time for our presentations, but I want to dwell on a number of conclusions here. And I like this image of um, you know, Canada and the, the greater Caribbean, and you see these vast archipelagic space. Um, I've been involved in recently in the field of archipelago studies, right? And archipelagic thinking in the Americas. And to, to get away from our idea of um, the continental thinking that we're kind of trapped in, and to think of us as archipelagos of connection, archipelagos of cooperation. So crucial to implementing such a vision is first of all, the transformation of US policy in the region. US government decisions, military actions and economic influence have long impacted the Caribbean negatively from our early ties to the slavery plantation economies to the damaging forms of over tourism to exploitative export processing zones and extractive industries such as bauxite mining, we have often failed the peoples of the Caribbean. And now our consumption of fossil fuel is driving climate emergencies, even while the United States blocks uh, climate displaced refugees from places like Central America and the Caribbean. We've closed our borders, we've deported people, many infected with COVID-19, sending them back to dangerous conditions. So weak US policy leads to more violence, including state violence, more drug trafficking, more undocumented migration and ongoing violations of human rights across the region. The Caribbean deserves better. It deserves US, Canadian, Chinese and African cooperation and good policies to help build thriving economies. The region needs all of us to build smarter, more cooperative relationships. We must help build food sovereignty, renewable energy, ecological repair and coastal protection gender equity and social justice, safe housing, fair migration policies, disaster preparedness and risk reduction. The prime minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, for example, in her recent address to the United, United Nations last year, presented a vision for digital investment, knowledge building and creative cultural economies as well as the kind of regenerative ecological economies that I've been talking about. So all of this requires cooperation um, around international climate justice. I believe that there is a demand already begun by the CARICOM countries and by Haiti for immediate payment by the USA, the UK and the EU of both slavery reparations and climate reparations. And that's a broader argument, which I, I won't give the details of here, but I think that's an important starting point. This is not aid, this is a debt that we owe already. And this can go into a reformed Caribbean Green Climate Fund and new financing mechanisms. And there, 
alongside that, we have to give international recognition and protection to displaced uh, what are sometimes called climate refugees. We must reject the depiction of climate refugees as a growing danger who will flood our borders. In fact, it's our way of life that has put these people in harm's way and excluded them from social protection. I also argue that we need to reject the, the co colonial or neocolonial logic that jumps to relegate certain islands to extinction and depopulation, you know, saying, well, well, we just can't live there anymore, forget that. And um, even as they eye these very places for valuable luxury real estate development. And that's what's happened in Antigua and Barbuda as Barbuda um, was evacuated during the hurricane and the Antiguan government has not allowed people to return there um, to what was a form of collective landholding and has instead tried to open it for real estate development. So this demands ending the ecologically damaging development projects and extractive industries that are slowly but surely destroying the last endemic species and ecological remnants of these islands. We need to break this cycle of extractive economies, fossil fuel and tourism dependence, labor exploitation and unsustainability. We also must reject the Caribbean as a logistics hub where nature becomes global infrastructure. And I do worry that some of the Belt, Chinese Belt and Road initiatives in the region kind of turn nature into infrastructure to serve the mobility of, of, um, of investment, of capital, but not necessarily to help the communities and the people in the Caribbean. We must imagine alternative futures for the entire region that will be more resilient and flexible that will allow for movement in the hurricane season if needed, for food sovereignty and security, for protection of water resources, for protection of coastal areas and fisheries, mangroves and coral reefs, and huge programs are needed to replant the forests and reseed um, the trees and the coral reefs. And we can also open communication technology con to connect people more effectively across the Caribbean and its diasporas and allow for easier movement between places by reducing the cost of travel for local people and the regulations of travel that make it difficult and by opening borders. And finally, we can learn from agroecological projects how to expand Caribbean food sovereignty and resilience through regenerative low-till agriculture, as I've said, through these kinds of indigenous um, gardening systems known as kanuko, which is an Arawak term, um, and using traditional root crops such as cassava or yucca as it's known. So I call on my own government administration, the Biden-Harris administration, as well as the Canadian and Chinese governments and African partners to learn from the mistakes of our so-called build back better policies, which failed in places like post earthquake Haiti, which led to corruption, gang violence and government instability. And to, we need to reflect on how we might better protect, support, and accompany our friends, neighbors, and allies in the beautiful but threatened Caribbean region. And I'm going to stop right there, which will hopefully leave more time for us to have discussion. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you, uh, Mimi uh, Scheller. We thank you for this very interesting presentation. We set the context of the challenges on the greater Caribbean. Uh, there are environmental dimension, but we, we cannot ignore, like you, you say, all the political and geopolitical issue for the future of this area. Thank you a lot. And with, uh, thank you Mimi very much, yes. And I do look forward to coming back and picking up on a number of these issues. Um, Great that uh, that you're linking um, the Caribbean or the Caribbean as a kind of a, a, a node that connects China and, uh, and Canada, and I think that's very good um, a good structure for discussion as we move forward. It's my pleasure now to introduce the third of our speakers, uh, Gilles Lieu. Uh, Gilles is a specialist in infrastructure and its financing, so he may talk about Belt and Road initiatives a bit in the Caribbean. Uh, he's director of the China program of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and of the Peking. University Lincoln Institute for Urban Development and Land Policy in Beijing. Uh, previously, as an infrastructure specialist at the World Bank, uh, he had operational experiences mainly in East Asia and South Asia, 
where he managed investment leading projects, uh, lending projects and analytical advisory activities uh, in the infrastructure and urban sectors. Before joining the World Bank, he was a research associate with the Harvard Institute for International Development. He also taught city and regional planning as a faculty member at Nanjing University. He's authored and co-authored a number of academic papers and uh, World Bank reports on topics including metropolitan infrastructure financing, low carbon city development, sustainable urban transport, motorization, uh, and poverty and transport. Um, uh, Xi holds a BS from Zhongzhan University and an MS from Nanjing University and his PhD from Harvard University. In uh, 2010, he served as vice chair uh, of the Global Agenda Council for the Future of Transportation at the World Economic Forum. Uh, in 2015 and 16, he served as a member of the expert committee for China's 13th five-year national social and economic development plan. So please join me in welcoming uh, uh, Julie. Ji, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Benjamin, for your kind of introduction. Uh, let me get my uh, PPT, see how it works. Is it working? Perfect. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, it's great to be in this uh, Kilo section. And I enjoyed the uh, previous uh, presentations about affordable housing in Montreal and also uh, the development issues in the Caribbean. And my topic is about the high quality infrastructure development in China. And I know China was mentioned and before my, uh, my presentation, but I'm taking you to have a look at the infrastructure development situation in China. Now let me try to turn my page. Somehow it does not work. Okay. Uh, uh, click on your PowerPoint yeah. and then hit. Uh, okay, yeah. it works. Yeah. And why I'm going to go through uh, briefly uh, are the following. And the first is uh, China's infrastructure development over the last uh, few decades. And the uh, uh, second part is. Um, a question, uh, if China is uh, unique in infrastructure development, I know many people around the world feel China is like a big builder of infrastructure, but let's see how it looks like uh, when we present the data. And then I will talk uh, briefly about the main factors influencing the future of infrastructure development in China. And finally, I will conclude with the and uh, challenges of the high quality infrastructure development. Okay. And as uh, you know uh, well, and China has gone through uh, uh, several decades of uh, rapid economic development. But the picture I show here is the rate of urbanization in China, which is, uh, uh, I mean, the trend is driven by the rapid economic growth. Uh, as you can see in the early 80s and China's uh, the rate of urbanization is around 20. And today, and our new census data show that the urbanization rate in China is uh, 63%. But we still have um, another halfway to go to reach the high level of urbanization similar to the OECD country and Latin America. Now let's look at the cities and China is quickly nice. And now we have um, a number of uh, major cities and we have uh, mega cities and Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, Chongqing. But we also have a large number of cities with um, population over uh, 5 million or over 1 million. And we have a large number of uh, county towns or so. So in the future, we, we expect that we have uh, another 15% of the, uh, the, the population uh, that were becoming uh, urban. And so that's the, and, uh, the projection we have and 1.13 billion uh, urban population or 75% of the total population by the year uh, 2050. 
Okay, uh, our team uh, did some uh, analytical work uh, using the um, uh, infrastructure uh, time share data uh, from China. And I would uh, uh, want you to pay attention to the quorum and that's called elasticity with respect to GDP, uh, which shows how much uh, infrastructure stock uh, increase with a percent and uh, increase in GDP. And we see all the elasticities are and, uh, greater than zero. So infrastructure increase with uh, GDP, but some infrastructure increase uh, at a rate faster than the economic growth rate. And here we can see expressway, high-speed rail, and also the mobile phone subscription. And these are the uh, high flyers in the infrastructure sector. And these are the data that we have uh, from the uh, 80s until recent years. Now, we also show some data here about the uh, access to the localized infrastructure by province. And the yellow dot uh, shows the and uh, the level of assets percentage around 2000, uh, just a few years after 2000. And the blue dots uh, are the level of assets uh, in recent years. So here we have um, a drinking water service, and we have the, and, uh, the, the clean fuel for cooking, and we also have um, an, an garbage treatment and we have the um, uh, sewage treatment. So we can see uh, for the last 15 years or so, and the access to uh, this localized infrastructure service rise to the level very close to 100%. And so that's the achievement uh, that we can see for the last 15 or 20 years. And then here are the number that's a bit more striking and that's the infrastructure investment compared to GDP. And I would uh, suggest you to look at the curve on the top and that's the percent of uh, GDP and that goes to the infrastructure investment, both from private sector and the public sector. And of course, this uh, percentage uh, is uh, very high. So many people would ask uh, uh, where China uh, get the money to build the infrastructure. But I will uh, highlight a few observations. And first of all, I mean, as you can see, we uh, divide the infrastructure into two categories. And the first category uh, is the cross regional infrastructure like the and highway and expressway, high-speed rail and telecommunication and electric, electric grids or so. And the second category uh, is the localized infrastructure that serve the settlement and the cities, like the urban street of grid power supply, uh, water and sanitation or so. So the data we show, I uh, just to show you in the pictures and we could see the and a major achievement in the uh, uh, stock of uh, infrastructure and also the and, uh, assets. And we also see that China uh, has been able to maintain a high level of uh, infrastructure investment. Is is China uh, very unique in the development of uh, infrastructure stock? And this is an uh, original study or original data analysis that we uh, had recently. Uh, we simply plot uh, the infrastructure stocks uh, by different physical type against the uh, per capita GDP. And each dot represents a country in our data set. And as you can see, the red dot is China. Now here we have uh, access to electricity, and uh, we have electricity ca capacity per capita. We have a paved row and we have um, a percent of road paved, okay? Several indicators and is not outlier. Okay? Using the 
international cross-country data from the World Bank. And this is uh, how we see uh, China as compared to a large number of countries. Okay, here again, we have um, a fixed telephone subscription. We have a mobile cellular subscription and also the uh, internet access and uh, um, uh, safe, safely manage the sanitation. Again, the red dot is buried in the thick. And so you don't see China as the outlier. Okay. We have a, 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 a statistical analysis, but I think the an, a plot uh, that tells the story more eloquent uh, statistical uh, uh, coefficients. Okay, and I show I will show you a few uh, more figures, and this is what we call the chopstick uh, the plot, and one line represents one country, and the lower end of the line shows the point of the country, and for example, the indicator of infrastructure against uh, the GDP of uh, early year. And the uh, point uh, is uh, the, the ending year uh, of the infrastructure level against the uh, GDP of the new year. So one line shows how the particular infrastructure stock uh, change over time with GDP, per capita GDP. And again, and China, uh, I use the arrow to show where is China because in the in, uh, in the picture the red line is China. I have to take take off my glasses in order to tell you where is China. And this is China, just around the turning point here. And then the red line is China. If you follow the the arrow to see to find the red line, and that's China. Okay. Again, for the four indicators. I show here China is not the outlier. And then another four indicator that show the an, uh, growth path of the infrastructure assets or stock. And China is again buried in the thick, not an outlier uh, in this plot. So this just, uh, tells you that China actually, I mean, the infrastructure development over the last 20 years, if we see this is a, a, a behavior and China is not really an uh, online. Uh, that's the major conclusion we have and we are sending our paper to a pro academic journal and, and to highlight this story. Now, uh, if we look into the future and we have a few main factors influencing the future of infrastructure development in China. Uh, income growth, of course, is a, a major factor and continuing urbanization. And now we have a major policy indicator that's the decarbonization uh, policy in China. And China just announced that, that the country will reach carbon peak by 2030 and net zero by 2060. Then our uh, urbanization will continue so as the concentration of population in some urban regions and the mega cities, particularly in the coastal, the eastern coastal regions. Now, of course, we are facing COVID and other uncertainties, and our population are rapidly aging. And we also need to develop a climate resilience in the future. And uh, of course, as uh, all of you uh, face, uh, there is the technological, technological advancement in the infrastructure sector. So these are the main factors that we consider uh, when we think about uh, where China is heading to in terms of uh, infrastructure development. But we also have a new policy for infrastructure because China recently adopted a development paradigm shift from rapid growth to high quality development. What we mean by high quality uh, development for infrastructure, I think that there are a few components. Uh, one is the provision of universal access to basic services, even though 
and our indicator show uh, that the access to basic services uh, is fairly decent, but we still have uh, some localities uh, where these indicators are not uh, good enough. And so we will continue to make effort on this uh, front. And then the second element is to meet the changing and diversified needs of the population. And we will also need to achieve the climate resilience and protect the environment and ecology. So one technical challenge we are now uh, thinking is uh, how we integrate the infrastructure planning and also uh, advance the technological and institutional innovation and improve the sector governance, uh, which is perhaps the most important. Okay. And in China now, we are thinking infrastructure a little bit differently because we are facing such a rapid change and also the underlying trend for infrastructure development in the future. In the past, we very much focus on the economic infrastructure. And in recent years, we uh, talk about social infrastructure such as a school, public hospital, and nursing homes or so. And then we also talk about in a uh, green infrastructure and include a greenway park and rain garden and um, perme uh, permeable pavement, stormwater management ponds or so, and collectively we call it sponge city. So these are the infrastructure for climate resilience. And we also have a new infrastructure and this is a 5G artificial intelligence, internet and data center or so. And altogether, it constitutes what we call the grand infrastructure. Because today we see a possibility that the new infrastructure can actually help us build synergy among different types of infrastructure, like energy and transport, economic and social and green infrastructure. So that's the kind of concept we have uh, when we uh, move ahead with uh, policy making and also sector management in the future. So now finally, I would just uh, say a few words. I mean, this is a major challenge for us. And because China has announced uh, a uh, target uh, for uh, carbon net zero by the year 2060. And so we will need to think of what uh, we have to do with infrastructure. And we think electricity generation, uh, it will be important to have very clean supply of uh, electricity, I mean, energy mix uh, from renewable source or nuclear power. And then uh, electrification, for provision and operation of uh, all infrastructure services. Uh, without doing that, I mean, there is no hope uh, to achieve the target and China will also phase out the fossil fuels from infrastructure and to the extent possible. And we will also uh, try to uh, develop the carbon sink uh, through, let's say, land conservation, forestry or so, uh, in order to absorb uh, the residual uh, carbon emission. And that couldn't be avoided uh, in the future. But a great deal has still need to be done. And when we move to think about the land use, how to optimize land use, how to use the pricing to regulate the personal behavior. And then perhaps the most important is the sector governance, how we get the sector organized and to achieve the uh, objective of a net zero. So this highlighted uh, the, the, the challenge we face uh, when we are asked to achieve the net zero policy. Of course, we have other challenges as well, like uh, aging and how to deal with the artificial intelligence and uh, things like that. But I will end here. I think my time is up and I will look forward to the discussion. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Yeah, uh, It's great to, uh, to have you involved again today. So um, again, I'm gonna reach out to anyone who may be uh, participating in the audience and encourage you to, to post questions either in the chat or, or in the Q&A.
Uh, and uh, Olivier, and I, Olivier and I will jump in with some questions, um, but we also encourage the three presenters um, who may have been exposed to information they hadn't known before or seen before uh, to post some questions. So maybe I will turn over to Mario first and say, do you have any, any issues uh, or questions or, or observations you want to make um, based on uh, Mimi or, uh, or G's presentation? I don't want to put you on the spot. Mario, you're muted. Mario, you're still muted. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> there uh, you go. These are three very different presentations, and I find it sort of difficult to link them together, which is, I mean, I learned quite a bit. It's interesting. But to be honest, I don't really have any specific questions for either of the other presenters. But I, of okay. course, welcome questions on my Thank presentation. You. I saw Mimi has her hand up. Thank you, Mario. Yeah. Thank you both for your excellent presentations. and. What really strikes me in thinking about the connections between them is the ways in which infrastructure and housing development in the Caribbean region have really had a sort of deficit of affordable housing and um, social infrastructure and green infrastructure, right? So the, the very things that we think are most important in our global cities in the, in the North um, have really been left uh, basically to the, the private market in the Caribbean region and to infrastructure projects that have really been aimed at business and economic development and not at social and green infrastructure mm -hmm. um, creation and, and support and financial mechanisms for doing that. So I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on how those policies and financial mechanisms could spread to other um, regions and, and maybe the role of institutions um, like the World Bank, for example, and what, what things they do fund and don't fund. Uh, if I can answer partly, I worked quite a bit in the Caribbean too for a while, especially in Haiti, but also in Trinidad and Guyana and Belize. Uh, the problem is of an entirely different order okay, because <clears throat> what I presented from Montreal assumes that you have a functioning state, okay? Uh, because part and part of the financing of the infrastructures, when I talked about financing infrastructures, means you have in place the, a system, cadastros, taxing, which allows the municipalities, the community to, to draw on those resources. And if you take a place like Haiti, which is of course, arguably by far the worst case, there is no real, there is no basic system by which you can even draw out the value that's even financed infrastructure. It's not even a question of market versus the state. The basics aren't even there. So, you know, you have to, <clears throat> if you want to be able to finance infrastructure, you, you have to be able to draw the value for the society. The word is taxes. You have to be able to tax the land and the value which comes out of it, and that requires a basic structure, which is not even there, because real estate taxation or land taxation is fairly complex. It requires a fairly sophisticated state. Uh, it not only requires that you have cadastres that function, but that you have a fairly honest and open uh, transparent system by which prices are, can be fixed. And unfortunately, there are very few places in the Caribbean. Uh, of course, places like Barbados is much, much more advanced or even Trinidad than Haiti, uh, which allow you to, 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 to use those, the finances which come from the land to then finance housing. So it's, 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 not, a, it's not an easy issue, which That's is something of fear in, in Montreal we don't even think about. I would love to hear from Xi whether there's a different Chinese model for doing that. Gee, you're muted. <laughs> well, I I want to uh, relate to uh, Mimi's uh, observation uh, that the development of the logistic hub in the Caribbean uh, may damage the ecological and environmental system there. 
And I believe this is a, a, a very good point. Um, if we look into the infrastructure development uh, history in China, and, and frankly, uh, over so many years, and our development uh, have had a major adverse impact on the ecological system and the environment. And only until recently, we recognize how important is the ecological system and the environmental quality. But and, you know, sometimes it's, it's a hard choice eh? when the country was poor and people think uh, development is the top priority. And uh, when the country entered uh, the, the rank of uh, income country and people start to uh, worry about the environment and they appreciate the environmental quality and that's how the development paradigm start to uh, shift okay so today uh, in fact we are focusing on how to resolve uh, the ecological protection resolve the conflict between ecological protection and continuing urbanization and infrastructure development now, of course, uh, this is a domestic uh, action in China, but I think we should have uh, some sort of a di discussion at the international level. I don't know uh, the action of a Chinese uh, investor in infrastructure in the Caribbean, but thinking about the threat environment over there, and certainly I think this is a, a key issue that we need to discuss and is an issue and that we need to think how to balance the need for development and also the need ecological protection. And regarding the affordable housing, we had a, an, a section yesterday, which is also shared by uh, Benjamin, and it's also a major issue in China. And my point last night, uh, I mean, my, it's my night time. Uh, <laughs> I mean, our housing provision can be divided into three systems. Uh, one is the an, uh, formal market, which we call the commodity housing. These are for the people who can afford whatever the market can supply. And then we have the government affordable housing program, uh, which only offer the access to the people who hold the residential registration for that city. But in our cities today, we have a large number of migrant neighbors who work and live in the city without a residential registration. And these people uh, find their home in the informal housing market, and that's urban villages. But over time, some Chinese city government try to clear the uh, urban villages because they don't like uh, the, the, the urban villages and they think it's uh, uh, kind of an ugly neighborhood in the modern city. But now we come to understand these uh, urban villages uh, actually uh, play a major social function for the migrant neighbors who cannot be served by the formal market, who cannot be served by the government affordable housing. So today we have the cities and the, like the city of Shenzhen where I'm sitting now uh, has a explicit policy to protect the, the urban villages and uh, mainly for the housing uh, access uh, of the migrant uh, labors. So this is the kind of uh, uh, information I can share. And that's why last night I said China should learn from the experience of Latin American countries and how to tolerate the informal uh, uh, informalities in the housing sector. Thank, thank you very great. much. That's so important that because you're pointing out that um, it's not all a private housing market and taxation, right? That then supports um, public investment. And it's so important to recognize that in Haiti, part of the lack of a good cadastral system and a private property market was kind of a defensive response of the poor, right? And of the excluded rural population to hold land collectively, to try to hold on to land as um, families, as groups, and to not privatize it because if it's privatized, it would get sold off to investors and they would lose it. And informal settlements also play that role of kind of collectivization and 
protection of a foothold on the land. Yeah, yeah the VICs are very much like that. I think the villages in the cities uh, in China where uh, they are still held by the, the, uh, the, the rural councils that, that were given access to that land while the land was still designated as rural. So it's, it's an interesting parallel. I'm always struck by the fact that um, when land is held that way, either by the state or collectively, it's impossible to collect taxes on it. And therefore, there's uh, so little money around to, uh, to, to fund infrastructure. And so it becomes a bit of a, a, a catch-22. Um, Lisa, uh, Luisa Gomez has posted a question in the Q&A uh, for Professor uh, Yeah, I think you've already answered it. But um, I think Lu Luisa was wondering to what degree China intends to apply the policies, the, the, the kind of sustainable policies that they're um, uh, applying to infrastructure now to uh, Belt and Road initiatives in other countries, or do they really leave it up to the other countries to determine whether or not there are ecological or, um, or other environmental implications to uh, the kinds of investments that China is, uh, uh, is financing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh uh, to very very briefly, uh, as uh, uh, Ben as uh, Benjamin, as you introduce uh, when you introduce me, you mentioned my career in the World Bank. I work in the World Bank for eighteen years, and and I work in Southeast Asian. And the time and I work, and China started to uh, finance infrastructure in Southeastern and uh, Asian countries. And so that time, I mean, then there were a lot of concerns. So I was in the international debate about how to do infrastructure right uh, in the international uh, cooperation. Of course, the best practice uh, examples uh, were coming from an, uh, international organizations like the World Bank and Asian Development Bank. Now today, uh, of course, everyone knows that China has the One Bell, One Row uh, program. And if it's done uh, within the bilateral framework, and of course, uh, and the uh, government always have uh, uh, some priority uh, where people uh, may not uh, like. And, and so, but we can see how the world uh, is changing and that the civil society participation uh, become uh, more and more important uh, in China and in other countries. And so I hope all these issues, uh, the environmental consideration and the uh, access uh, of infrastructure for poverty reduction uh, can be it discuss more in the, uh, in the international uh, platform and also some uh, new uh, international organizations that come me into the scene and uh, work with uh, the, the Chinese uh, L1 role like the Asian and Infrastructure Investment Bank. So, and I am sure these uh, new international organizations are very much aware of the issue and they try to uh, help improve the uh, practice. So that's where the hope uh, is. But I, I don't think we have done uh, enough and there are a lot of thing, uh, work to do, a lot of effort required. So I think at the international level, there should be a lot more discussion on this kind of and a lot more action to balance. Yeah, I, and I, I would just add to ahead, that. Man. I think it's also, I mean, it's crucial that the places that are developing green infrastructure are not just exporting the environmental impact somewhere else, right? And mm -hmm. we take great, great care in terms of when we're doing uh, mining for metals, like where, you know, how is that being done? Where is it coming from? Or fossil fuel extraction, um, or, uh, you know, I, I've done work on uh, aluminum and bauxite mining and the, the mm -hmm. we need those metals right if we're going to build electric uh, infrastructure and so on but the rare earth metals and the lithium and you know the bauxite are, are coming from latin america and africa and um, i think we need better international policy around that yeah yeah one one always has the sense or at least the reputation is that uh countries <laughs> especially developing countries like to deal with china uh, rather than the World Bank or or the U.S. or the European Union, as much as in as much as China has fewer strings attached to their investment, fewer conditions put on it, um, and and therefore um, they you know <laughs> it's easier to get away with things as it were. Uh, it's just a lot more simple. Which raises a question for me for Mimi. I mean, I don't know the Caribbean very well. I had the opportunity of working with a student last year to do uh, the redevelopment proposal for Trenchtown in uh, 
in Jamaica and learned a lot uh, about what's going on there. But I wonder, and here I'm going to shift over to my Word file so I can see. Um, two things struck me about you, your presentation. Um, one is, uh, you know, the, the diversity within the Caribbean. The, you know, it's it's a real mosaic of islands with with different governmental structures, with different colonial pasts. Um, uh, really, it's a, it's a it's it's a massively diverse group. First of all, I guess, is there is there any equivalent to the African Union for the Caribbean? Is there any sort of top-down um, organization to which the various islands are beholden to, to, to larger standards, or is it every every island for itself? So, I mean, first of all, as you say, it's a it's a vast region, right? It's it's spatially huge and it's incredibly diverse politically. And so we're talking about you know, there's ter Departement of France, there's US territories. Mm -hmm. I mean, so some of it is part of um, the Netherlands, right? And uh, mm -hmm. others are independent countries. Um, other, others, you know, there's so, there's so much diversity there, as you say, and at different uh, levels of, of GDP and, you know, different social um, investment levels. So uh, what I was talking in very broad terms, right? But obviously there's a lot of difference. In terms of unity, um, it's difficult because there's CARICOM, which the Caribbean Economic Community, which unites some of the former like British West Indies that became independent, tried to form a West Indies Federation, um, which lasted for a very short time and then fell apart back in the 1950s. And then the independence movements, um, which came in the, in the 1970s and into the 80s, um, as well as of course the um, socialist governments um, that exist also in Cuba. Um, so, when, when, you know, there's no one size fits all policy yeah, and yeah. there are efforts to build unity across the region, but it's, there's multiple languages and political mm -hmm. entities. So it's very, very challenging, but I think we need to grapple with that and help um, the, within the Caribbean, there are, are efforts to help build unity across the different linguistic and political areas and to sort of mm -hmm. overcome some of that fragmentation. And I think that could be really helpful. Yeah, because I, I, you know, oh, sorry, Olivia, did you want to chime in? Uh, you're muted. I no, I, I think we are, we are in a very theoretical um, territories then it's very difficult to develop exchange between these different territory uh, and this the exchange is essentially towards centrality outside of the uh, of this area then it's a main problem for the organization yeah. of this area yeah i was i was thinking too that i mean the the the, the paradigms that you were putting forward Mimi, are just remarkably good <laughs> but you think of different countries with uh, different political systems and 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 very acute short-term needs who are willing to sort of do anything, including, uh, you know, welcome extractive industries or whatever to solve those short-term needs, um, understanding that even, you know, notwithstanding the long-term implications of it and trying to get countries with very, very acute short-term needs to think in the long-term um, must be ex incredibly challenging. Um, I don't know if that's, uh, that, <laughs> that statement means anything at all, but, uh, you know, I, you know, you're you're really looking at it. Sort of, I, I you know, I think of China's and China's five-year plans, and you know, a, a pro proclamation goes out from the top, and everything changes. It's amazing. China can turn on a dime. Um, but when I think of of, of political regimes uh, in the Caribbean, um, you know, and the short-term gain of of, of 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 deals with the devil, um, you wonder how how you get out from under that and get the big picture. Which is part of, I mean, why I'm calling for a climate justice and climate debt um, reparations framework, because it gets us out of like the competition for um, aid, right? And that, yeah, that yeah. we're turning to the international community or the um, uh, financial institutions to somehow like bail out these suffering places, when in fact, we should turn the tables on that narrative. And we should look at what we've what we've done, what we owe in terms of the creation of the current conditions, and that we owe both a, a, a debt for slavery, right, which is very clear for yeah. France, the UK, uh, the Netherlands, and so on. And and in some cases, institutions have started to repay that slavery debt, but also the climate reparations debt, which would put especially the the islands, uh, the island Caribbean, right, in a in a position to really 
self-determine and build out its own social and green infrastructure if it had that financing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I uh, I wanted to make a, a, another observation with uh, Professor Lewis, uh, and this is uh, yeah. Full disclosure: I, I was uh, I'm an American as well, so uh, even though I've been in Canada for <laughs> the majority of my life, um, the the sense in the U.S. of course is Canada that China is rising as, a, as the new power and is, uh, has a competitive advantage because the state has invested so much in infrastructure and so everything is shiny and new and up to date in in uh, in China and therefore Chinese companies have this massive, as it were, subsidy in the form of uh, infrastructure. Uh, that's being paid for by the government. Uh, the last big infrastructure injections in the U.S., I guess, were at the Second World War and uh, and with the highway system in the 1950s. So those are a half a century ago, um, and everything is aging. Um, so I thought that your charts showing uh, infrastructure investment on a per capita basis really actually put it in perspective, uh, because I think what we tend to forget is how large the population of China is. And if we look at infrastructure investment on a per capita base, basis, it actually looks much more modest, uh, as you've shown, than when we think about it in an absolute terms um, uh, or compared total investment in China versus uh, you know, in other countries. So I thought that was very good and I appreciate very much you doing that. Uh, and this is back to a kind of a Mario question. Um, in Canada, uh, which is quite provincial and small by comparison to China, we, you know, we've just gone through this period where uh, Montreal basically fell apart and has to be putting itself back together again. Montreal invested massively in infrastructure in the late 60s as part of the Canada centennial. So bridges and highways and subways were built and they all hit their life cycle literally in the same time and everything fell apart. I mean, bridges were falling down on people, highway viaducts were, were crashing uh, hither and thither. And still, I think a lot of Montreal is being patched together with carbon fiber, if I'm not mistaken, Mario. Um, I, you know, we can't help wonder about China, all this investment in such a short period of time and what happens 40 years from now when it all starts to fall apart. You know, it's it's one. <laughs> it's hard not to think about that. So, do, do you, would you like to respond to that, uh, Professor Liu? Uh, yes, very briefly. And in fact, when we uh, work on the policy study of infrastructure, one major piece of uh, recom policy recommendation uh, is that we will need to take the top priority for infrastructure maintenance. Okay? And in fact, China. Uh, over invest quite a bit and underspend uh, for uh, infrastructure maintenance. Now, this is a, a bit like a global phenomenon. Uh, government like to invest, and but they always uh, forget uh, to the, the maintain. So most of the infrastructure asset decline and uh, faster than it should be. And so we are actually trying to and uh, introduce the international best practice uh, example of uh, infrastructure asset management uh, mm -hmm. to the Chinese system. But this is not enough because this is a really a technical practice uh, in order to maintain the infrastructure in time. And the real concern is when the peak of infrastructure investment is over, and the public expenditure structure gradually change. And a lot more money would be spent for uh, social protection or so. And then by the time an infrastructure uh, become uh, deficient, and it's very difficult to reorient the public uh, mm -hmm. sector expenditure back to infrastructure. And that's how mm -hmm. we can see, how we see the problem in the United States. But how to find a, a, a balance solution is still a kind of a challenge for us. <laughs> at least you have the, the West to, you know, to, to look at and say, we know what's coming down the road here. At least we can plan for it. Yeah, Mario, yeah. do you have any comments on that? No? OK, you're muted, by the way. Uh, I mean, Canada and the US, unfortunately, is fairly typical. You know, it's always much easier to build a road you know, to, with a big poster near the, the prime minister or the president looks in front of this poster and says, whoopee, we've spent so much money. <laughs> repairs, you, you, your repairs don't make the headlines. Your repairs are tedious and they're not politically very, you know, there's not a political payoff. 
So I think in that sense, you know, going on with Professor Yu said, is uh, you know, it's a challenge for China to not to fall into the same classical you know, uh, rut, which is not just a Canadian, but it's American and you know, oh, yeah. many European countries where you know building is sexy, but repairing is not, <laughs> and uh, it's it, it is a problem, and it's a, it's a political one, and so. We'll, Hopefully, China will do better than we did. Mimi, did you want to weigh in? Just, I just want to add that. So, some of what we um, celebrate as like great infrastructure investments, but such as the U.S. highway system, were also very harmful, right, to African American communities that were devastated by the building of the highways through their uh, cities and neighborhoods and business districts. So, that I think we need to also think about the difference between these big infrastructure projects versus other ways of funding infrastructure. And I'm going to give an example from Port-au-Prince, Haiti, uh, a French NGO called GRET. Uh, GRET worked with some of the informal communities to provide water through what they call social engineering or social infrastructure, where small groups of people were organized and got together to provide small payments to build out their own water system. And as they built that water system, they also maintained it and they collected payments that were then fed back into socially voted upon community um, projects, right? Like schools or, or um, healthcare or things like that. So there's other ways to think about how do we fund infrastructure? What's the appropriate mm -hmm. scale that we're building it at and to build social care and maintenance into the creation of that infrastructure? That, uh, yeah, that reminds me, um... In Ottawa, for instance, we uh, we're we're along the Ottawa River, so we collect our water upstream, um, which is to the west of the city, and then we, um, we we channel it through all of our pipes. We purify it and drop it in downstream to the east side of our city. It all goes to Montreal. Um, the uh, there's been lots of movements to look at. Uh, decentralizing water management um, to do it on a kind of a, a district level. And the city has basically said, absolutely not. Um, it all has to be centralized, which means we're pumping water for miles and miles and miles from one side of the city to the other, just to purify it and dump it back in. But the city says it, it, it can't accept liability. Uh, it can't manage um, decentralized or, or privatized water management and it's it's just not going to get into that game and so it it pushes back constantly uh, on, on these kinds of initiatives um, so you wonder in port au prince it's it's great but if you know if the pipes get <laughs> if the pipes gets switched or or something goes wrong um, who's responsible uh, it's it's a tough question really uh, right these were places that had no piped water at all at all yes they, they had nothing <laughs> And I mean, yeah. but I think it is a, d a debate about, you know, centralized public provision, which is the model of like the modern city mm -hmm. versus yeah. the need in the face of climate resilience. Do we need more um, patchwork approaches, decentralization, mm -hmm. both of um, renewable energy and water systems and, you know, green um, uh, absorption, the sponge uh, that, that- I like that sponge city, yeah. 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 Uh, having having walked along the Huangpu River in Shanghai, uh, it is amazing what uh, what China is doing with the, these kind of sponge environments. It's it, it really is setting. Uh, and I, you know, one of the things that I this is neither here nor there, but one of the things I find tragic about this whole discourse in the West about evil China and uh, you know is that that we're we're losing, we're not traveling there as much, we're not seeing as much of what China has been doing, and um, and China has been doing some amazing things, which are just getting written off as a kind of a bad rap onto some kind of political idea of uh, Xi as uh, the new Putin. Sorry, uh, uh, Xi, I didn't mean to, uh, to diss China there, but that's really the discourse that we're hearing a lot in the West. Um, Olivier. Yes. So what, uh, one uh, question more from Mimi uh, Chela for following the idea of the um, what is your, your point of view about the um, diaspora uh, in this uh, time, in this context of crisis? I think the, the role in the diaspora is very specific for uh, the, all the different countries in the Caribbean area. Each country have this own diaspora uh, who, who, who act for, for support uh, in this time. Perhaps you can develop a little more the, this point. 
Yeah, the diasporas have been incredibly important, um, both for financial remittances, of course, which support many countries in, um, and especially Haiti, um, where, where the economy is so challenged. But also, I think the diaspora is really important in terms of building up um, uh, cross regional and cross language connections, right? It's always played that role, right? Where the mm -hmm. people from different regions of the Caribbean have met in diaspora and have formed organizations that are pan Caribbean as well as pan African. And here mm -hmm. to bring in Africa again, I mean, the relations between the Caribbean independence movements and the African independence movements and pan Africanism are very, very important and deep and continue to provide a sort of model for a different model of development, a different vision of um, a, a decolonial and anti-colonial forms of development. And that um, pressure of that kind of thinking remains very important today. And the diasporas can help feed into uh, political policy making and thinking in Canada, in the US, in the EU, be, it, where their voice can be heard and help pressure our governments to to create um, more constructive policies in in both the Caribbean and in relation to Africa. I I really see that in Canada. I mean, my experience of living in Canada is uh, living within a, a very diverse diasporatic community um, where we have students from various Caribbean islands, where we have West Africans interacting with uh, with uh, Islanders. I mean, people get thrown together in in really wonderful ways. And you're right, Mimi. They they create these kind of organizations which are are pan Caribbean, uh, which wouldn't and couldn't happen. Uh, Mario, I'm, I'm guessing you want to talk about Haitians in Montreal. Yeah, you know, Quebec, of course, is a special case. I mean, the link with Haiti yeah. is so close that it's almost uh, incestuous. You know? <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, yeah. it's, the Haitian community is arguably the biggest non, let's say, native community now in Montreal, and very active <clears throat> in Haiti, and everything that happens in Haiti is immediately on the news here. Just you know, in the current government, uh, the CACA government, we have two ministers who are of Haitian origin, okay? and the leader of the opposition in the National Assembly, Dominique Anglade, <clears throat> whose parents I knew very well, and unfortunately both died in the the earthquake. Um, <clears throat> uh, she's Haitian. She's of Haitian origin, and may well be the next premier of Quebec. You know, yeah. ha Haitian. So Haiti, for mo for most Montrealers, especially French-speaking Montrealers, Haiti is almost not a foreign country. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember many times I was in Haiti, and I talked to the students. They often get, they even get taught Canadian history. Quebec history in the, in the primary schools, the influence has been so strong. Yeah. So in that sense, the diaspora is almost not a diaspora. It's almost like a, you know, as we say in French, va vient coming back and forth constantly <clears throat> with, with Haiti. And the, the, the influence of the Haiti, I won't go into, of the diaspora is both good and bad. I mean, unfortunately also often involved in, in Haitian politics and even in the recent events uh, God knows, you know, what some of the links were, and they were perhaps not always totally positive. Yeah, yeah. And Toronto is a, a big center. Caribana Festival in Toronto is a yeah. kind of pan-Caribbean mm -hmm. festival. A lot of Jamaicans and uh, other English-speaking uh, Caribbean uh, uh, immigrants uh, band together there, which is quite, quite good. So I think Canada definitely has a role to play. I mean, Canada grows exclusively by immigration. And so uh, we are really <laughs> the kind of place where everybody recongregates and as you say, then could could move back. At the same time, Canada is always talking about its own diaspora that Canadians are leaving and going to the States. So it's this, uh, this massive uh, movement around. Um, well, I think we're, we're coming to the close of our session. Any further comments before we, uh, before we close out? I, I did want to say, I mean, this is a strange, uh, you know, we are an organization that looks at uh, Africa, China, and, and Canada. And this, uh, this particular keynote is, is, is notable in, it, in as much as it, it threw three very different talks together. Um, um, 
you know, we've added the Caribbean this year, which is really interesting, but I find a lot of uh, overlap between what's going on in the Caribbean and what's going on in Africa. Um, I think it's actually quite interesting to throw three different regions and three different talks together and see what we have in common. And I think a lot of really interesting discussions come out of this. I'm absolutely delighted to have um, uh, had the participation of all three of you. And um, so I, I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of the CASA to thank you. Uh, and to thank Olivier again for all of his great help in pulling this conference together and to linking us up with uh, with Nina. Well, I'd like so, to thank the chair. I'd like to thank Benjamin for doing a really great job. <laughs> thank you very much, for you. <laughs> We're reading your book in uh, Ottawa, by the way. Uh, Which your, book? your recent book, the the recent one. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, our ULI group, uh, Urban Land Institute in Ottawa, has been. Uh, been looking at that that book because we're working on an, a, 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 a multi pulp series on affordable housing. So you might be hearing from me. If you have any comments, I'd be, get, I'd be happy <laughs> okay. to get them. The negative <laughs> comments <weird>. included. <laughs> okay, great. I'll well, just again, say one, one uh, thank ahead, you. Man. And also to mention that the, the global school at WPI, you know, sends students around the world on interdisciplinary um, projects uh, and we really value uh, international education and continuing to build, you know, connections and bridges across the different regions of the world. So I think it's great that um, ICASU is doing that and um, a, a Chinese, Canadian, African, and, you know, uh, now Caribbean. Lots of Americans <laughs> in there and Caribbeans and Latin Americans. Um, we need to speak to each other and continue yeah. to do that. Yeah, there's so much. Uh, we are so interrelated and interconnected that it's fantastic to get together and sort of talk about the ways. Uh, Professor Liu, thank you so much. Uh, you've participated twice in this conference and it's been fantastic. I have a colleague who spent a lot of time in China and said that uh, was just um, struck by your candor, the, the straightforwardness of your talk. It's not. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's refreshing. So thank you very much for bringing the Chinese perspective. Um, Thanks. Great. Okay, with that, uh, we'll call it to a close. Again, thanks to everybody. And um, I guess um, from here we go to paper sessions, those of you who wanna continue on in the conference. Um, but uh, again, I look forward to staying in touch with all of you. So good day to everybody. Good evening in Beijing or Shenzhen and, and we'll see Thank you soon. You. Yeah. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.